Great. Thank you very much. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'd like to do, I'm going to spin around a bit so you can see me, um, is give a kind of overview of the kind of works that we were thinking about when we curated the show. I think quite a lot of these works will be unfamiliar, so I hope there's a chance to see them, or at least to see extracts of them. Um, and I'd like in this talk perhaps to give you some reflections on the curatorial issues that were involved in putting this show together and to put this work into some kind of context because the question always has to be what distinguishes this work if we want to make a kind of category that we might call Eastern European or Central European art of this period. So um, I should stress that this was a jointly curated show that I worked on with Daniel Muzichuk. Um, it was over the summer last year in 2012 it's called Sounding the Body Electric, and it ranged across Eastern Europe. So we had works from Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Soviet Union, Yugoslavia. And I suppose one of the advantages of that geography is it allows for some degree of comparison to be made. And clearly the Yugoslav case, in terms of cultural history, marks some degree of exception as well. And perhaps that's um, something to reflect upon. Um, I've called this talk Ultrasound because I think in a way these works that I'm going to show you are about producing a kind of heightened experience of sound, but some of these works also claim to be diagnostic. They seem to want to tell us something about the society from which they came. And before we get into the works, I just want to make a couple of observations about the way that we curated the show, and then I'll come back to that theme right at the end, which is um, the show was really a cacophony. We, uh, we used a combination of devices to try and isolate sound. We used headphones for some works. We had pooling speakers and directional speakers. We carpeted some of the environment. But ultimately, we accepted that sound is a spatial object, that it, it fills its space, and it depends on its space. And so to walk into a sound show where everything is closed off and in headphones is a very different kind of show from the one that we wanted to produce. So once we accepted that, there were all sorts of problems, but it seemed to us that it produced something that reanimated the work, gave it a kind of pulse and a certain sort of life. So I'm doing a rather tidy talk for a show that wasn't quite as tidy in terms of its oral effects. The other observation I'd, I'd make just at the beginning is that we were very interested in the materiality of sound. Um, we were very interested in the, the way that sound is delivered through the world, the way that it's recorded, the way that it's distributed. So we had a kind of interest in technologies, and we tried to make these technologies apparent to the visitor in the show. So we selected film material that tried to capture a bit of process. And I think one of the logics for this is a fairly simple one, that with an audience that might understand sound enclosed within this object in front of me as being a very easily manipulated object. We were kind of keen to show some of the challenges involved in, in making the works, making those pieces of electronic and uh, electronic music and music concrete, or issued as vinyl records. All of these things had a kind of material form. So this is really not a very good slide, but I'll show you in a little more detail in a second. We tried to show often source material alongside the resulting artwork. So this is a piece by Dora Maurer, the Hungarian artist who worked with a composer called Zoltán Jene in 1980 to make a film called Kala, Hungarian artist and musician. This is a little extract of the film. And the, um, Maurer produced these coloured panels which corresponded to the dynamics and the pitch in Yene's music. Um, and that she, in order to do this, she was able to generate these images very rapidly, but it took three weeks of very kind of careful editing to get sound and image to correspond in this kind of extraordinary and sometimes quite painful way if you, if you spent a lot of time in that space. So we were preoccupied with the materiality of sound, partly to try and capture that sense of difference between then and now. I think there was also an attempt to some, sometimes try and produce something of a kind of restoration of effect as well. You probably know these pieces by Knizsák, very widely reproduced. And Knizsák originally intended them as sound works, as far as I understand, um, and that only in the 1970s were they exhibited on the walls of galleries. And so what we really wanted to do, is, even though we would exhibit these objects, was to try and recapture their sounding qualities and also the material 
the material origins of these works. You know, that he initially scratched these records and destroyed them in various ways. He cut them into sections, into halves and quarters, and then would replay them so that you would get this sort of um, premonition of sampling, in a way, mixing of different musical sources with a kind of regular beat. We'll hear a little bit here. So to try to restore works that have been separated in some fashion, art historically. Um, the starting point for this show really was um, to really identify something that seems remarkable and yet remarkably understudied in a way. It was to do with the, the spread of recording studios, experimental recording studios across Eastern Europe from the late 1950s which largely set out to explore electronic music and music concrete. So the first one of these is set up in Warsaw in 1957 by a young musicologist, a guy called Pat Kofsky, and it follows fairly rapidly um, on the heels of Pierre Schaeffer's studio in Paris in the 1940s and the famous studio in Cologne, which had been established in 51. So the Warsaw one is set up in 57. Um, it's far less well known than those other two examples, but it is a kind of pioneering location for the development of electronic music. So an example of this is Penderecki's work. Penderecki made Psalmist here, working with two singers, a baritone and a soprano, took constants and vowel sounds and then processed them through synthesizers and filters to make this kind of extraordinary soundscape. And he does that in 1960, 1961. So this is a kind of pioneering space in the history of electronic music, but it's kind of overlooked. It's also the first in a series of these spaces across Eastern Europe. They're in Moscow, they're in Brno, they're in Prague, they're in Budapest, they're in Belgrade. So there's this infrastructure that's produced in the course of the late 50s and 1960s, which is a kind of remarkable infrastructure, all generated with the resources from the state, the communist state, sort of post-Stalinist state. And I suppose ostensibly their most significant function, the one that we'd recognise, is that they supply music for films. So Artemyev, working in Moscow, produces these kind of remarkable pieces for Solaris, producing these electronically generated tones, being able to build kind of massive banks of chords to produce this rumbling uh, sentient planet. And we can find lots of films. Penderecki, for instance, is working with filmmakers supplying um, uh, the, the film industry of these countries. But I think the engagement with the visual arts in the studios is much more significant than that. They become these kind of important nodes, not just for connections with cinema, but also with new forms of art practice, happenings, experimental artist films, the making of experimental sounding objects. And this story hasn't really been told, and we, we felt that we should put some energy on this story in a way. Um, I think the other thing that we should say about these studios is that they play a kind of interesting disordering of practice. They really become spaces that encourage intermedialism. So this is the work of a musical composer, Jene, a Hungarian composer. He's one of the founders of the new, the new music studio in Budapest. He seems to be triggered to make an artwork, to make a film piece, so that's his film as well. He seems to want to move between disciplinary boundaries. So that seems to be of kind of considerable interest for us. And we could trace Flux's connections here quite strongly, but I don't really want to do that today. That work's been done, it's been done extremely well, so we have a good kind of sense of east-west interactions inter, inter and, and reactions. But I think what's really interesting about these... Um, these experimental recording studios is their places for East-East interactions as well. So that we know that this Warsaw studio, set up in the, in the late 50s, attracts a lot of the, the most significant Yugoslav figures, people like Detoni and Radovanovic, who we're going to hear in a moment. So these East-East connections are kind of important. So, amazing infrastructure built in the course of the 1960s. And the obvious question is, what benefit did this technical infrastructure bring 
to the state. This is a Marxist-Leninist environment, just claiming to be managing the collective resources of the people to, towards some kind of common end, this end of uh, communism. So what role did these fairly expensive resources, equipped often with Western technologies, what role could they play, did they play in the task of creating this communist world? So here's one answer. This is a newsreel made in Poland in the mid-1960s. Generatory tonów i szumów, filtry i modulatory. Oto zespół instrumentów, którymi operuje Józef Patkowski i jego współpracownicy w studio eksperymentalnym Polskiego Radia. Tutaj zmieniają się w konkret najśmielsze pomysły twórców muzyki konkretnej. Słyszymy w tej chwili jedno z tych nagrań. Na stereofonicznych magnetofonach ze skrawków taśmy montaż ilustracji dźwiękowej dla radia, filmu, telewizji. Niektórzy nazywają to kakofonią decybeli, inni radosnym śpiewem przyszłości. Ale na tym właśnie polega prawo do eksperymentów. So some call it a cacophony, others say it's the joyful song of the future, this is what the right to experiment is about. Some kind of loose ideological proposition that's sort of being made here, kind of interesting to me. And I think, here's a claim that says, the right to experiment... Here's a claim that's being made on an experimental recording studio. And it might be worth thinking for a moment, well, what is an experiment? What makes something experimental? And I think that's an important question in Eastern Europe, because clearly the proposition being made by the Soviet bloc is that its citizens were living as part of a great experiment. You know, history has said that the diagnosis is, is of a failed experiment, but nevertheless at the time... Um, people in Eastern Europe were told that they were living in an experimental society. And the state, throughout the 1950s and 60s, seems to want to establish all sorts of experimental institutions, experimental radio stations, experimental housing design offices, and so on. I think this had a particular appeal or a particular resonance after the death of Stalin. Stalinism evidently had been irrational, had been brutal, and that for the post-Stalinist regimes after his death in 53, but really after 56, the only way in which to claim a certain sort of legitimacy to say we have the right to steer history was to say we are rational, we are progressive, we are scientific. And that this construction of an infrastructure of institutes across the Soviet Union, across Eastern Europe, scientific research institutions, is all about somehow realising this claim. You know, so a field like cybernetics, which had been under prohibition during the Stalinist years, suddenly becomes the legitimate science. And we have this massive infrastructure being built of these research institutes. And interestingly, they often provide a kind of setting for artists and designers to work, that experimental practices of art and design could be harnessed into this new infrastructure. So this is an example from Kazan. It's uh, produced by an institute called the Prometheus Institute, which was sort of a, a parasite or had jumped on the back of the Kazan Aviation Institute in 1962. And the primary function of the Prometheus Institute was that it was going to make instruments in the space race. Never made a single instrument. None of its products went into space. But the people behind this institution were obsessed with uh, light music. They were interested in the synesthetic relationship between light and sound. And they used the resources of this institute to explore these ideas. And you can see that they're called the Prometheus Institute, and there's a kind of echo of Scriabin here, his colour organ music and so on. Sergei Andreev, student of the Institute. If in the first place there was a whole screen, В этой системе исполнители могли управлять движением света по экрану, используя эту вот клавиатуру. Легко сказать, используя. 
ума сойдешь, пока найдешь концы. Ничего, не ждать же, когда музыканты сами сядутся, паяльники. Мы многое получили от этих экспериментальных концертов. Вначале зритель мог примириться с любым исполнением, но затем он становился требовательнее. Да и нам самим становилось ясно, для того, чтобы эксперимент стал настоящим искусством, нужно отойти от самодеятельности как технической, так и эстетической. My typing was as musical. <laughs> um, it's okay. Claims being made here about experiments again, and and this particular zone seems to bring together uh, two parallel, but perhaps rather different fields: the fields of art and the fields of science. And the word experiment clearly means different things in those contexts. If we draw down a cliche, the scientific model of the experiment is the sort of bounded. Uh, investigation of knowledge, something that's done in specific defined conditions, it's based on repeatability, you know, if I do an experiment and I can do it again, I have a kind of discovery. And this scientific conception of the experiment is inherently a kind of progressive one. It seeks to produce knowledge, it seeks to move from kind of the unknown to the known. And it seems to me that one thing that the Soviet authorities wanted was sort of dependability and this progressive ca character in the Cold War race. What they wanted to do was be able to advance through science and technology. So um, we have this kind of model here, and uh, at its heart is a, a kind of um, a preoccupation with uh, producing a kind of self-regulating system, a kind of cybernetic system which would have information and feedback, but all of those problems of the Stalin years would disappear. And Soviet life suddenly in the 60s starts to get these images of intelligent machines which would sort of strip away the irrational, strip away human error. And we can see sort of echoes of this in other parts of uh, Eastern Europe as well. So outside the Soviet bloc, uh, cybernetics was a shared preoccupation. Uh, I'm interested in the work of this figure, Vladimir Bonacic, who worked at uh, the, the sort of cybernetic center in Zagreb through the course of the 60s before he emigrated to Israel. He was a mathematician and he was very interested in patterns and sequences, so he used computers to try and uh, produce uh, these, these patterns and sequences of some complexity. And this is one of the few pieces of sort of early electronic computer art from Eastern Europe that still exists and functions. It's a remarkable object, it's about two meters high, it's absolutely vast. Here's um, Bonacic talking about Usually, usually sequence, pattern sequence. It's very long, days, or years, and by help of the computer, we can travel in time. What means that? It's just simply that by computer, we can jump for a couple of days or years to structure we would like to observe. And this is a way by which computer travel by maximum speed, searching for a pattern from which we can start our sequence. we can travel to the future. It's a very explicit claim that's being made here. And of course, traveling to the future is precisely what these Eastern European states claim to be doing. Um, so here we've got all those echoes of Ligeti saying that, you know, one day in the future maybe we won't need composers because we can simply have a computer compose serial music. And here we have, you know, in Bonacic's work, a particular vision of the experiment which is located in a laboratory, it's in the institute, it's using technology, it's using mathematics. What I'd like to do is perhaps just uh, 
try and suggest another zone of experiment which perhaps might be more familiar to us, uh, the zone of so-called experimental art. And I'm thinking here about kind of early happenings, use of event schools, installations and so on, which I think in some ways have a kind of parallel relationship with these claims on science, partly by the claim that they're experimental practices. So let's have a look at one in particular. This is another experiment. It was originated by a sculptor called Henrik Morel and a composer, Zygmunt Krause, a fairly prominent composer in Poland today, and an architect, Teresa Kelm. And they invented something that they called the spatial musical composition in 1968. Morel just had died, but they achieved this thing in a, in a, a fairly prominent gallery called Spulchesna, the Contemporary Gallery. And it's a sound installation. We remade it in Wuj. It's fairly large. It would occupy this room and a half again. And you walk through a kind of environment where there are six booths with sort of baffle walls, um, each equipped with a, sound, a source of sound overhead. It's a speaker playing a tape, and the tape is of different ensembles of instruments playing, playing music. And the light effects change as you walk through. So we recreated this, and this is a recording. Yeah, here it comes. Each booth delivers a different recording, and as you choose your journey through, you're effectively balancing the sounds within the piece. So you're walking through this thing that's like a soundscape. Um, and the, the sense is, the claim that's made by the artists at the time is that you, the visitor, are mixing that sound. That you are somehow recomposing the piece. You are becoming the author of a, a distinct and individual experience that you have and nobody else has. Now, clearly we can make lots of connections to different musical preoccupations across the world, particularly concerned with chants and so on. Now, let me just try and keep this in Poland for a minute and try and explore what the intellectual origins of this piece is. Where does it come from? Where does this idea come from? It's made in 1968, but I think it owes its origins to a set of propositions that have been made ten years earlier. It's actually a realisation of an idea that had been made by a Polish architect, Oskar Hansen, and Józef Patkowski, who'd been the founder of that experimental studio of Polish radio. They came up with a scheme in 1958 to invent a pavilion for the Warsaw Contemporary Music Festival. And this was to be a kind of another experimental zone where visitors could experience what they called the spatiality of music. This was to be a large sort of fabric structure suspended in the manner of Fray Otto. You can see here some um, indications of human scale. And that as you walked through this structure you would be led down sort of sleeves that would take you to a sounding source and that you were encouraged to walk through this space to pursue those sound sources, again, to make your own composition. Hansen said each could walk their own chosen path as if they owned the music. This spatial relativity will bring you, the listener, closer to the experience of music. You will integrate the sound with your movement and the musical sounds will also combine with the the, uh, the uh, outside world, this was to be by the banks, banks of the Vistula River. So this is all about kind of sensation, stimulation of the senses. And this project was for Hansen one of his early examples of a kind of uh, theoretical proposition that he'd made in 1957 called the Open Form. It was a manifesto that he wrote in 1957, where he said, artworks, buildings, interiors should be incomplete, that architects and artists and designers should purposefully design incomplete environments and thereby encourage the participation of users or visitors or viewers to complete those spaces in some fashion. And that in making those completions, uh, these open form spaces would encourage a sense of being embodied. It would remind people of their human capacities and abilities. So this is quite a sort of decentered conception of space, but also of the authorship of an artist or a designer, that somehow it should be distributed. And Hansen's kind of back in vogue because of all of these discussions around participation recently. <laughs> 
And I think this idea, the pavilion that you walk through, and also the open form, are really a product of their time. This, they're made immediately after the death of Stalin. They're in that de-Stalinizing moment, a kind of moment of great turbulence across Eastern Europe, where publicly dissenting intellectuals are demanding substantial reforms. A kind of existential moment takes over intellectual life in places like Budapest and Poznan, where people are encouraged to somehow possess their fate and their destiny, to take to the streets. And I think you can see a kind of echo in a, a project like this which accentuates the individual. It says, for the individual to exist, they must take action, they must do something. You can sort of hear an existential preoccupation. So, I think what we have here is a, a project that ostensibly looks quite novel in 1968, but really can be traced back ten years earlier, and it comes at the end of a particular sensibility that I would call Thor humanism. Um, let me just think about this in terms of experiments for a moment. So this looks like an experiment, but we have to ask, well, kind of what, what sort of experiment is it? It's not behaving in the way that we might expect the scientific method to behave. This is not a repeatable event. It's supposed to be infinitely variable. Each experience was supposed to be different and distinct. And ultimately, this experience of walking through the space denies any possibility of a singular authoritative viewpoint or experience. And that's really, I think, in the air in Eastern Europe, right through the 1960s. This idea of um, the, the act of interpretation as being a creative act is there in works like these graphic scores. This is the work of Bogusław Schaffer. He claimed an idea that he called polyversionality, that music should be polyversional. It should allow for all sorts of interpretations and change the relationship between the composer and the producer, the performer, sorry. That a graphic score like this should serve as a suggestion for a potential performer rather than a kind of dictate, this is the way it should be played. And of course, all of this is familiar. We can trace echoes right through to Cage and so on and to Stockhausen. But it seems to me it's very marked in Eastern Europe because the idea of escaping command had been given such resonance during the, um, the Thor period. And I, I could take you through many examples of this. We showed quite a few in, in, um, in Wuj. This is the work of Milan Adamczak, who's a Slovak artist, still alive. He said at 1969, a composition is only a suggestion, a guide for the greater self-realization of the interpreter. I think that's a kind of Thor intellectual thinking again. This was a score that required being thrown across the ground like a dice, and whichever side landed up was the side that had to be played. Here's another figure that I'm really interested in and doing more work on. This is Kotlin Lodic, who was a member of the Bosch and Bosch group. She was from Novi Sad in Yugoslavia, so northern Serbia, but the Vojvodina, a sort of a, a place, a multi-ethnic place, lots of Hungarians live there, and she's from a Hungarian background. And she produced these, um, I suppose, kind of feminist works in a way, graphic scores for what she would, um, she would use them for her own phonopoetics. Po she sliced up material from women's magazines, often West German, which is kind of interesting. She would also incorporate sewing patterns and stamps, um, 19th century music scores, and then she would interpret these in situ for public performances in a kind of very variable fashion. So there's a kind of echo of traditional notation in this, but there's something much more. I don't have any film of her performing, but this is um, effectively her interpreting with her voice. 
street sounds and then has these kind of high trills. She also speaks Hungarian and Serbian, so she has all of the phonetic range of those two rather different languages. And this sort of natural capacity of the voice just seems to break down in her works. It becomes sort of involuntary or instinctual or something. I'll come back to that. Um, another piece we can see, there's lots of these sort of improvisatory works. This is much closer to jazz. This is the work of Milan Grigar, who's a Czech artist, and it's called Finger Score. He made this first time in 1972, but we're looking at a, a 1982 film. And he would take a, a, a musical score, just the staves, and he would tap sort of inky fingers across this score, all prepared with those staff lines, and then would give it to musicians. <laughs> So this takes us to a kind of zone of improvisation that might become more familiar, I think, you know, we start to think about jazz and so on. Well, so what's the relationship of these two things, this technological scientific zone of the laboratory and then this experimental zone of the, um, of the happening or the, the event? Clearly works like this um, spatial musical composition are much more heuristic rather than scientific. It's all about experiencing the world through the body, through emotions, through pleasure. I think experiment really means something much closer to the uncertain and taking pleasure in uncertainty than the certain. And yet the language is the same. So one way of thinking about this might be simply to say that experiment is a kind of rhetorical screen. The state is saying we're investing in experiments and that if you're an artist or a musician and you want to require the resources from that state, you want to set up your laboratories and studios, then you speak that language, you sail under the same flag. And this would be a kind of illustration of what Miklos Horosti calls the velvet prison, the idea that you draw down resources for a kind of illusory freedom. I think that's partly true, but I think the other thing we have to bear in mind is that certainly through the 60s, Many of these works are underscored by a strong sense of technophilia, a really a genuine, uh, serious commitment to the capacities of new technologies, of te electronics, magnetic tape, cybernetics. And probably some of this work, I think, is raising questions about what the nature of utopia is when it's understood in technological terms, questions about the neutrality of technology or not. So just very briefly, it's a wonderful proposition, it's a kind of a thematic exploration of the idea of utopia and technology by an artist called Jerzy Rosowowicz, who was from Wrocław in Poland. And he had this concept of a neutral drum, an idea that he comes up with in 1967, which is to be a 100 metre high inverted cone. It's set on an open plain near a large town. And that you would travel through the core of this structure on a super speed elevator and you would shoot through the darkness and you would come out on the top onto a kind of circular platform on top of the structure. <clears throat> and that platform was effectively a mirror, so you would be bathed in a kind of cacophony of light. Or if you fancied an alternate journey, you could get inside this enormous 35-metre ball, which would roll around <laughs> the foot of the tower, and it would be filled with light and with sounds. So this was like a kind of closed universe of sensation. Now, according to Rosowowicz, what was required to make this proposition was precisely the kind of socialist coordination that this kind of scientific revolution of the state was promising. It needed psychologists, physicists, physiologists, mathematicians, electronic specialists, cybernetic specialists. And in all of this was a neutral object. It was to be a high-tech structure without purpose, without utility. If anything, it's kind of wrapped up into a kind of, I think, a sort of mystical view of technology that you could certainly trace to the Soviet Union at the same period. I mean, if you just think about Solaris and so on, you can see echoes of this kind of cosmic sensibility. I think maybe this is about trying to restore a sort of fa fantastic dimension to utopianism. Now, what does the socialist look utopia look like by about 1970? It's a very kind of drab world where the state is promising you an apartment 
in a high-rise block, or if you're lucky, maybe a tiny bad copy of the fiat car. <clears throat> Here's a kind of proposition that says we can expand our imagination and our horizon to produce something like a, a utopia. It's what Adorno would call a, a negative utopia, a, a, a utopia that stands to stop the foreclosure of the possibility of another way of being. Um, Coming to really just to the sort of last section of this talk, really, where I, I just want to push a, a different sensibility that starts to emerge. A, criteria, a clear critique of this sort of um, fascination with the experiment, with ideas that technology was neutral, and the idea that uh, Thor humanism could restore the individual. This starts to emerge by the late 60s. And I think there's a very interesting fault line in Eastern Europe probably falling around 68, for reasons you can imagine. And I could pick various examples, but this is the one that we worked on, and it raises curatorial questions, it seems to me. This is a piece put together in 1970. So you've got to remember this is just two years after that, that booth that you could walk through with the sounding booth, sorry, the, the spatial musical composition. It's 1970, and it's made by Krzysztof Odichko, who lives here, and Szabolcz Esteni, who's a composer, Hungarian, but living in Warsaw. And it's called Just Transistor Radios. It was first performed in 1970, and then we created it in 2012 for the exhibition. So this is Esteni revisiting his own history in 2012. These are largely classically trained musicians as they were in 1970. They're playing transistor radios, all from the right period, which were then, of course, relatively new products in the People's Republic, and they're working to a graphic score that had been prepared by Vodichko and Esteni. The composition says to each player that you must modify the, um, the dynamics of the radio, the volume of the radio, or the frequency, or the tune. So effectively, each radio starts to become tuned to a different wavelength. We'll hear it in a moment. As I say, ostensibly, this looks very familiar. We could go back again to John Cage with his imaginary landscape number four, performed with radios in 1951. But the key and the telling detail in this piece is all of those performers wearing earplugs. They're emphatically blocking their ears to the sounds that they're generating themselves. So what kind of significance might we attach to that, that gesture of blocking the ears? It seems to me that we can probably start to think about it in a rather specific context of Eastern Europe. This is the sound of a radio jamming signal that was used in the Soviet Union to block out Western radio. So in the course of the 60s and 70s, these, uh, these techniques for jamming radio become more and more elaborate. Um, after music is used to overlay voice and so on. And this sort of breakdown in, in radio broadcasting, turning it into something like cacophony, I think can be understood in terms of uh, a register of politics. Radio Germans on the Rise in 1968 during the Prague Spring and the subsequent invasion by the Warsaw Pact forces. Radio Germans on the Rise in 1970 because the Poles are protesting in the streets. So there's a kind of sense in which this is a reflex, a political reflex in some fashion. Now, Vodichko is the author of a number of works that I think seem to have this kind of critical dimension. Working again with the experimental studio of Polish radio, he produces another artwork the year before in 69 that seems to connect with ideas of surveillance. Uh, he starts to use radio wave technologies, which have been associated with people like Theremin and the Soviet Union, used in spying technology. So this is his personal instrument which is a device that's worn on the head and the hands. And what, what happens in this piece is it, the sound responds to the movements of the wearer. The individual can amplify 
the sounds in the environment by opening their hands or reduce the sound by closing their hands. They can filter that sound and render it more distinct or less distinct with the other hand. This device is the personal instrument, so the sound that's generated is only for one individual. It's not a collective experience. We're going to hear something like the sound in a moment. So I think there's lots of kind of echoes in this in this object. It's got echoes of <coughs> the performances of the theremin in the 1930s. You know, theremin develops these first uh, musical instruments and then develops the same technology to make uh, espionage devices. It's also got echoes of the Soviet avant-garde, the idea that you can have a symphony of a city by playing the sirens in a city, as happened in Baku in 1929, I think, 24. But I think also this, this piece is sort of allegorical. It, it refers to surveillance. It refers to the kind of social anomie that's been produced in the People's Republic in Poland at the end of the 1960s. I think it also does interesting things to the body. It's kind of unclear whether his actions are his own or whether it's the technology which is somehow moving him. I've got an image of the musician under the control of his instrument. I think there's some kind of post-humanist sensibility starting to emerge here. And we can put this work in the company of others, which I'll do briefly now, works that seem to explore unfreedom. Those earlier thought works were about the freedom of the body. These seems to be about the unfreedom of the individual. So this is the work of um, Russian sots artists, Kamar and Melamed. Uh, they were to have their first show in the mid-70s here in New York, but they were denied permission to travel. So what they did was they took the contents of the internal passport in the Soviet Union, which gave you the right to exist in different cities, and they treated it as a musical score. So each letter in the passport becomes a note, it corresponds to a note, and effectively it becomes possible to play the internal passport of the Soviet Union, which they arranged to happen in a number of different places on the same evening around the world. So in February 76, they're performing in Moscow because they're denied the opportunity to travel. Whereas in the Feldman Gallery here in New York, Charlotte Moorman is able to play this composition on her cello. It's actually strangely beautiful. I'll play you a bit. This is the Krasny Quartet playing it in 2000. Mm -hmm. Soviet party. Um, so I think you know something interesting is happening by the early 1970s and we can sort of start to think about the distinctions here quite clearly. You could compare this polyversionality of Schaffer's work that we've touched upon with something that you might call a kind of critical cryptography, a kind of close reading of, of documents and so on. My last example really is um, another work that I'm very attached to, and again I'm working a little bit with um, its composer. It's a figure called Vladan Radovanovic, who was a composer and artist with a long-standing interest in what he called voco-visual arts. And he made a recording um, in Radio Belgrade's electronic studio, so another one of these uh, nodes in this network of technologies, which was then released as a vinyl 45 RPM single. And it's called The Voice from the Loudspeaker. And it offers a set of reflections on the recording and the broadcasting of the sound of a voice. So we hear a voice speaking directly to us in both the Serbian version and in this case, uh, the voice of an English composer called Paul Pignon. You can hear me. This voice is in you. This voice is in the loudspeaker. This voice has nothing to do with the loudspeaker. This voice is where the loudspeaker is. This voice is where you are. This voice is reaching your ears. Your hearing is reaching out to this voice. 
this voice comes into being before you hear it. This voice lasts after you have heard it. If I say I am speaking louder, louder, it's truer. If I say I am speaking louder, louder, it's truer. I just ruined that, didn't I? I've edited it, so there's another little clip just from the end. The end is very interesting. When I say I, it refers to me, not the voice. When I say I, it cannot refer to anything but the voice. This voice is quieter, but the meaning is unchanged. The voice is getting quieter can mean something else. I am getting quieter and quieter, but only on the recording. In fact, I am talking just as loud as at the beginning. In fact, it's not me talking at all. In fact, it's not me talking at all. Some new sensibility seems to be at work here. Something else, you know, where this is a, a new kind of um, sort of preoccupations with doubt, doubt in the voice, or maybe um, it's about doubt in the body. You know, what happens if hearing is located in the hands? It's a kind of interesting proposition. So, something very different by the 1970s. These works are only, as they say, 24 months apart, maybe less. But I, I think in a way, one marks the end of a particular sensibility, that kind of Thor modernist view of the world, which is quite euphoric, predicated on the individual. And the others suggest something much more dissenting, darker, more critical. And we could probably tell a story from the Vodichko piece on 1970, which would tie us into a story of dissent if we wanted to. I'm hinging these two works together, and clearly what's in the middle is the repression of the Prague Spring. So there's a there's all sorts of questions there about the use of technologies, recording technologies, broadcasting technologies, and so on, by the state that perhaps alter perceptions. So that's one conclusion. But just to give you another brief conclusion, just in a, in a, perhaps a minute or two, there's another way of thinking about these two pieces, which I think is quite important in curatorial terms as well. Many of the works that we exhibited in Wuch have their origins and sort of events, their happenings, their environments. They're effectively fairly ephemeral works that happened in a particular time and a particular place. So some issues start to follow from their reconstruction in 2012-2013. And our, our response to those issues was quite particular. Firstly, when we remade works, we tried to work with the originators of the work, so we could work with two of the three people who were involved in originally creating this work in 1968. So we could understand their, their interests and their motivations. And I think what we produced is a relatively accurate facsimile of what appeared in the gallery then. The same can be said with this piece here, um, the transistor radio pieces. We worked by bringing these two figures together. They hadn't spent any time in each other's company for 40 years, so it was a really extraordinary thing to do. We worked hard to source radios from the period, um, not because we're fetishists for technology, but those radios behave in a particular way. Um, and we also turned to a group of classically trained musicians by gathering students from the Wooch Music Academy to play the musical scores with the same figure conducting. It's kind of old and new, or sort of inevitably folded together in these, in these works. And I guess veracity, some kind of truth to the um, intentions of the originators is really an obvious thing to say, but there is a difference here as well. i just use this as my final point. <clears throat> I think that this piece, the spatial musical composition, lends itself to reconstruction. Its creators, I've argued today, had an essentially kind of humanistic view of individual experience. They, they believed in the validity the significance of every single encounter with that work. That every single experience of walking through that space was as valid as another one. That was their viewpoint. So I think in a way to enter into this space today and to make that composition again is a logic that's shared with the original logic of making the work the first time round. I don't think reconstruction is particularly problematic. 
And maybe that kind of euphoric work has a sort of universal claim. All bodies, all times, all places. I have slightly mixed feelings, I suppose, if I'm very honest, about what we did with this piece, just transistor radios. It was created in very specific conditions. You know, I've alluded to radio jamming and so on. But it was in a specific time, in a specific place, with specific people performing. And I think it's very difficult to recapture that moment in 1970. For a start, the first thing you hear on the radio as they tune in is Fatboy Slim, you know, British um, DJ. So it's very different. But, you know, maybe the, maybe the potential is that this work has a longer life because it has all sorts of resonances that run through the situation in Poland today. You know, Catholic Church now owns a lot of radio stations which are broadcasting pretty strong propaganda and so on. So maybe it has a kind of different set of potentialities. And that's where I finished. Thank you. Thank you.